thank you very much for all um, taking your time out of your busy schedule at the weekend to, to join us. Um, and as I said, it's, it's either a good morning or a good afternoon or a good evening. Um, and welcome to the first session of the day of the United We Teach Summit. My name is Stuart Weston uh, and I'm an International Education Advisor at Participate Learning. Um, for people just joining, I'll, I'll ask one more time if you could have your video screens on and have, be on mute, um, and that'd be great. Um, again, if you could use the gallery view, that would be great. You get to see all the different people on your screen, um, and Katie will be sharing her presentation as well when we start. Um, we also encourage you to use Twitter if you can, um, and use the tweet, uh, use the hashtag, sorry, United We Teach, um, and I'll show you that at the end as well, where you can see all the different people that are engaging on the session throughout the day and all these other sessions. And um, while we are going through the presentation as well, if you could, if you do have any questions that you'd like to ask Katie at the end, please put them in the chat. And what I will do is I will run through them uh, in the last part of the session as well. That would be great. So as I'm sure you've seen in the introduction, we've got a real mix uh, of attendees today. Some of you may be familiar with Participate Learning uh, and some of you may be familiar with the United We Teach community, but some of you this might be your first time attending a Participate Learning event. So Participate Learning is an educational organization based in North Carolina, United States. For over 30 years, we've been promoting a passion for global learning and appreciation of other cultures through our teacher culture exchange program as well as our global educa education and dual language programs. Now, the United We Teach community was cre created almost one year ago as a gathering place for teachers from all over the world who were looking to connect with other teachers and were looking for support during the new reality of schools during the global pandemic. In less than one year, this community has grown to over a thousand members who connect with one another via a community discussion forum, as well as via weekly live sessions. United We Teach Summit is a wonderful opportunity for all of you in this community to come together live and continue to learn from one another and also make some new connections. And for me, it's a great pleasure today to be introducing Katie Gurley uh, for the first session. Um, Katie is a primary school trained teacher from Scotland who will today be showcasing the opportunities of being global in the classroom. Katie is an ideal person to present on the opportunities of global connections with her teaching experience literally taking her around the world. Katie has taught in Malawi, North Carolina, uh, London and in her home country of Scotland and at every place she has worked at building these connections, relationships and experiences to inspire her students. Katie, thank you very much for agreeing to present here today. Uh, and without further ado, I'd like to pass over to Katie, who's going to start her session. All right. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be with you all. I've had a wee scroll through the chat, so it's great to see where everybody's from, Moldova, Chile. Um, it's amazing to see how many countries are represented in the chat. So the title of my presentation today is Local is Global, Creating Classroom and Community Connections Through the Sustainable Development Goals. And so I'm just going to take you through some of the strategies that I've used in the classroom, examples of experiences that we've had in the classrooms and how we have incorporated the global goals into those to make them at the core of learning. So a little bit about me, as Stuart said, I am Katie Gurley. At the moment, I teach primary four in the UK, which is the equivalent of third grade in the US. Um, I spent some time teaching in Malawi, which is a landlocked country in Africa. I spent a little bit of time in London and I spent four years teaching in North Carolina with Participate Learning. And I'm now back in my home country in the city of Glasgow. So that's a little bit about me before we get started. Um, so I am very, very passionate about global learning. I believe it is a vessel that we can use to open children's eyes to the world. Um, so why do I choose global learning? I think that global learning equips children, global citizenship equips children for a globally competitive world. We're no longer just competing with local people for places at university or jobs. We're competing on a global level. So global learning prepares children for the global economy and the global workforce. 
um, giving children a vision to the world in order to broaden their options. The more children learn about the world, the more they realize what is possible, the more they realize what avenues and roads are open to them in the future, and therefore it instills um, an element of lifelong learning in students as well. It also, for some children, it opens eyes to a world that they may not ordinarily get to experience or have the opportunity to experience. So it really brings the world to the classroom and allows students to hear the stories of people around the world directly from them. And my kind of favorite thing about global learning is it nurtures global citizenship. So in order to promote understanding in society and understanding as they go into this com globally competitive world, global learning is a great way for students to be able to develop their understanding of the world around them and their place in the world. And that's just one of my favorite quotes down there by Robert A. Scott, who did a piece for um, UNESCO on global citizenship. And you can find that in the UNESCO library online. All right. So the sustainable development goals are the main method that I choose to bring global learning into the classroom. The fantastic thing about the sustainable development goals is they offer so like endless opportunities for project based learning and inquiry based learning. And really, you can pass the ownership of these projects over to students and they can kind of carry them forward and transform them into whatever they want to be. So loads of loads of opportunities for project based learning, which I'm going to go over some of them today. It helps students to understand global issues at a local level. Um, which I think is really, really important, not only seeing global issues as things that happen in other countries, but understanding what those global issues look like at their direct global level. Um, it provides ample opportunity for active inquiry-based learning. There are so many trips you can take. There are so many experiments that you can do. There are so many connections that you can make. So it provides loads and loads of opportunity for making learning active and making learning fun. The other thing with the sustainable development goals is it digs deeper into global learning. So it goes just beyond the surface level um, kind of global learning and digs deeper into global issues, countries, infrastructure to give students a deeper understanding of, of what the world is and how the world functions and where their place is in the world. It also provides a really good opportunity for discussions around social justice when we're looking at different um, global issues at a local level and then we're comparing them to um, issues in other countries. It provides a great vessel to be able to have uh, conversations around social justice. Um, it's also a fantastic community. If you have some time today or, or whenever, if you just go onto Twitter and you search hashtag uh, teach SDGs. There's a huge communi community of other teachers on Twitter um, that are doing the same thing. So it's a, it's a great opportunity to connect with other classrooms and other communities. All right, so what I'm gonna do in the next few slides is I'm gonna take you through a few examples of some of the projects that we have done um, in classrooms over the past few years and ways that we brought different curricular areas kind of into these collaborations. Um, this one uh, was one of my favorite ones. We partnered with a Malawian classroom and the sustainable development goals that we were focusing on was life, in wa life below water, decent work and economic growth, climate action and industry innovation and infrastructure. So as you can see, just from one project, you're able to pull four goals in and they're really quite encompassing goals that give the project a different angle. And um, so we partnered with the Malawian classroom. And the reason that we did that is um, at the time they were looking to explore, the country were looking to explore for oil in Lake Malawi, which is a beautiful big lake in the country of Malawi. And there was a lot of local and global concern about this. So as a class, which was a third grade class, um, we researched what it meant to drill for oil in bodies of water. And we looked at other examples of um, areas in the world where, um, oil had been drilled, looked for or drilled for. And then we also looked at the effects of oil, you know, what can go wrong, what's the impact on the environment, um, and students looked like that. We, we then tied it into a writing unit that we were doing on opinion writing and persuasive writing. And so we did a lot of research around the lake and in, in, around the lake topic. In social studies, we looked at the land use around the lake. 
So we connected with local people uh, to find out how do they use the lake, what does the lake mean to them in terms of um, decent work and economic growth, how do they get their livelihood from the lake, and what are the industries around the lake that could be affected. Um, we then looked at economics, so at the same time we were doing an economics uh, unit and we looked at profit and income, what were the natural resources around the lake that could be used, what were the, um, the kind of fish that could be sold or what were the other experts that could uh, exports that could be found in the lake that could generate income for the country instead of oil. Um, as I said, we also connected with uh, local people around the lake to find out their stories about the lake and what it meant to them. And then we partnered with a classroom in Blantar, Malawi, um, who had mostly all of them had experienced the lake and the children exchanged stories. So my children in North Carolina wrote emails, sent videos, um, and asked the students in uh, Malawi about the lake, what their experiences were of the lake and what the lake meant to them. Um, and through all of this, uh, the children in my class created a letter, wrote a letter to the Malawian president and uh, we sent them off. And in their letters, they gave recommendations for other economic areas um, that they felt could be explored. Um, they kind of wrote about the stories that they'd heard um, about the lake from the local people and uh, we sent those letters off but one of the things that they really enjoyed in this experience was connecting with the local people because they became very very passionate about the lake and very very passionate about the oil drilling and so being able to connect with the classroom and hear directly from those students what the lake meant to them or directly from the local people and what the lake meant to them it just added a whole other level of um, interest and engagement into the project and it deepened their understanding of what some of the climate action issues are around the world. Um, one of our next ones was a local water source class collaboration. Um, and this one focused on life on land, climate action and life below water. And again, what we did here was we partnered with a local Malawian classroom. Now, initially the project just began in our own classroom, looking at our local, our local water source, uh, which was a wee creek just down the road from the school. We went out to survey and observe the water source. And then we did a little bit of research um, on the local land use around our creek. So following the creek up to see what kind of industries are beside the water or use the water or how the local communities or government are using the water. Um, they, we then went to see the water ourselves and observed um, and did a little kind of on-site research. And then we connected with a classroom in Malawi. And the aim of that was that the classroom in Malawi were going to go and observe their local water source in the exact same way and see what their issues with local pollution were and then come back together to compare to see that actually, yep, yeah, this is a global issue and it's happening in North Carolina, but it's also happening in Malawi. So finding that commonality and realizing that, yes, this is a global is issue, but it does actually also affect us at a local level and we can actually do something here to impact this. So we also looked at life forms and animals that use the water and how they're impacted by any kind of pollution and then we brought that back to the classroom and we started divine, uh, designing water filters. So each group of children took um, a sample of water from the creek and the same in Malawi, they took a sample of water from their creek as well. And then the kids got to work um, trying to design water filters that would be able to filter through the water and take some of the pollution out to try and find some solutions. Uh, so we did that and we compared, you can see in this picture here, that's a picture of us down at the creek, surveying and observing and taking our data and observations. And then this is us back in the classroom. You can see the sample of water there. And um, this is us working together with a parent volunteer to try and create a filter um, that would filter through the water and children worked in groups for that and then compared their results with the school in Malawi. And then each of them collaborated together as two classes uh, to come up with solutions to try to stop pollution. Um, so my class chose to do a public service announcement. So they made videos, um, which we put out online and we put out on Twitter. 
um, using Adobe Spark software um, and they did that and that was their way of creating more awareness. We, we also invited the parents in at the end of our project um, to see all of our connections that we made with our classroom in Malawi and show them the videos and to show them our water filters and our public service announcements. So we had a kind of celebration at the end of the project to launch the public service announcements. And we also were able to, what I like to do if I'm doing a collaboration is I like to try and bring it through every curricular area. So in numeracy, at the same time, we chose to study um, water and measurement. So at the same time as we were looking at this in social studies um, and in writing and in science, we also brought it into numeracy by measuring the volume of water, understanding um, water sourcing around the world um, and how different people access water and kind of what that looks like and what that feels like by measuring the water and, and weighing the water and carrying the water ourselves. Um, and as I said there, we exchanged letters and information uh, with a Malawian classroom and they did the same thing, except they chose to make posters at the end of their project to share with their local community. All right, another thing I like to do in the classroom is to have speakers join us. And this is a really, really great way um, to share in projects or to add something else to a project um, that you're already doing in the classroom. For this one, we were looking at uh, plants and soils, which I know if you're in third grade in North Carolina, you know that that comes in as part of the curriculum. And uh, so we decided to kind of add a different layer to it and learned about plants and soils. What, what are the different reasons that people plant for? Um, how do people use plants and, for, plants and soils to actually keep themselves going and use that as their main source of food? So for this one, uh, we tied it into zero hunger and to climate action. And so we started off the project just by looking at where do we source food from or where do people in our community um, source food from as well. We then connected with a Malawian farmer um, named Mr. Dixon. And Mr. Dixon is a subsistence farmer, which means a farmer who grows food for their own personal use or for their own family's use. And that's their main food source. So we had the opportunity to connect with Mr. Dixon. Um, he took us down with his um, phone to see his farm. And we got to see where he plants his crops. Plants actually did, um, we had the opportunity in that moment to do a farm to plate study with Mr. Dixon. So he took us down to his farm, he picked crops and then that he dried out and you can see it's quite faint there, but in that picture, um, you can see that he's actually showing the students how he then takes the maize that he grows and creates it into a meal for his family. Um, so that was really, really interesting for the students to be able to see how he goes from his farm to his plate um, in terms of a subsistence farmer to keep himself and his families going. Um, we then compared, our, compared it to our own food sources. Um, looking our, in our community um, at the different ways that people source food, including, um, you know, looking at zero hunger. People source food in our communities in many different ways. There are supermarkets, there are allotments, there are um, also food banks that people get their food from. So looking at how that SDG linked into our own communities and how people source food. And then we had a grow. We had a go at growing our own food as well. Speaking to Mr. Dixon and how he does it, and he explained the process to us, and we followed his steps to um, grow our own food. Which you can see that we are happily um, harvesting our cabbages there. Um, I think we had some carrots as well, and maybe a pumpkin. So just going from that first point of reflecting in our own communities and what the issue likes in our own looks like in our own community, connecting to someone with direct experience, then coming back and putting that learning into practice. So that's one example of a, um, a person in another community that we collaborated with. And what you'll notice is there are different ways that you can collaborate. There are classroom connections where you can partner directly with a classroom and work directly with a classroom, but there are also people in communities around the world that you can connect with as well. So one example would be Mr. Dixon. And then these are another couple of, of examples here. Um, the first one is my good friend, Mixon Falaweki. And Mixon Falaweki is a Malawian innovator. 
who invented the Padoku charger. And the reason that he invented the Padoku charger was he was frustrated with the load shedding electricity in Malawi. So he created a device that charged as he cycled his bike to work or to school every day. So that no matter what, he also had charge and he had always had charge in his phone and he always had charge in his torch. And um, so he created the Padoku charger. So we were lucky enough to be able to speak with him. He showed us his Padoku charger that he had created. He showed us it in action. And then he talked through the reasons behind affordable and clean energy and why that's important to the Earth's future. And he also talked about innovation because he won um, Global Innovator of the Year 2016, I think. Um, so he also talked about the importance of innovation in your com in communities and working together to solve problems and create solutions uh, within the community. So we had a great time with him and he spoke through some other forms of um, renewable energy with us. So we went back and in reading, we were doing a non-fiction study. So we looked at other sources of renewable energy um, and in science, we looked at solar energy and wind energy in particular. And the students came up with this design to create a solar energy oven. So you can see that um, pizza box there and the students created this to be able to make s'mores on their break time. So they designed it, they tried it, um, it didn't quite work. So they took it back in, they looked at what they could change, how they could harness the sun's energy to make this oven. Um, and then one day as a special treat, we bought some graham crackers and some chocolate chips and and during the break time, they set this up. And by the end of break time, they were all enjoying their s'mores. So that was just another way to take the learning and the, the knowledge that we got from mixing Falawaki and put that into practice, um, looking at Sustainable Development Goal 7 and 9. And then over here is my friend, Mr. Moanga on the screen. And this ties in with our water topic in one of the previous slides, although we didn't di directly co collaborate with him throughout the project. Um, I wanted the students to hear about water sourcing in his country and how he accesses water now, how he's accessed water in the past. So the students spoke to Mr. Mwanga and they were able to ask him questions about how he accesses water in Malawi. Um, and he gave a very honest account, which is one of the great things about collaborating with speakers from another country is you're hearing an authentic story and you're hearing an authentic experience. Sometimes when we just read things online or we're looking in books, um, we don't always get that authentic story that comes across. And so Mr. Murat Mawanga was really good um, because he kind of went over that actually a lot of people in Malawi do have running water in their home and they do have a tap in their home and they don't have to walk miles and miles to get water but that experience is there for some people. Um, and when he was younger, he had to do that, but now he has access to water within his own home. So just speaking to Mr. Mwanga was great because after looking at water, um, I know if you're, you're in third grade in Wake County, you're gonna be doing the EL curriculum. And then that last unit, when you look at water, um, speaking to someone who has that authentic experience just kind of brings a whole new layer um, and brings up an honest conversation for the students. So that was good for them to hear from him how he accesses water in Malawi and how other people in his community access water. All right, this one is a little bit different. So this one um, I did using a Google Docs collaboration. And so what I did was I created a collaborative document and I went to different teacher groups on Facebook um, and I posted the link to the collaborative document and I invited classes to share with their students and create global word problems. And the whole aim of the project was that we'd have different classrooms from around the world posting maths uh, word problems um, into this Google Doc. I know a popular thing is at the start of the lesson is to have a word problem up or to have a kind of brain teaser up at the start of the lesson. And the aim of this was to kind of make that a little bit global and create a connection across the world. Um, so for this, we created a collaborative document and I posted it in several um, Facebook teacher groups and just said, if anybody would like to collaborate, just let me know. And um, we had quite a few classrooms that wanted to collaborate. And so it ended up that these classrooms would post a word problem one day, we'd solve it the next day. 
in the Google Doc, um, then we'd post a problem for them, they'd solve it the next day, and we were just kind of ping-ponging back and forth. We ended up with quite a few classrooms involved, which was fun, because we all had to go at each other's word problems, and they were coming in from all over the world. And it was a really simple thing to do, because it was just a Word Doc, and teachers could just go into that Word Doc. Some teachers did share um, photos and videos, which was really fun, because some classes would choose to leave a video on the slide of them speaking the word problem. Um, some classes would post a video and kind of say, you know, that one you gave us yesterday was a wee bit tricky. Um, I think you were trying to catch it out with us. So we ended up with really nice relationships between the students as well. And they looked forward to the word problems each day. And it was a nice way for us to connect as teachers as well. In fact, one of the teachers who took par part in this project, Tasha Jordan, I don't know if she's in here or not, um, actually later became a participant participate learning teacher after hearing about participate um, through this collaboration but it's just a really really fun and easy way to do it and it's a way to have multiple classrooms from around the world in one space connected and it's a really kind of low um, maintenance way to kind of connect on, on a daily basis with the class and it's a fun way for the students to engage as well. All right um, so another thing that we did, especially at Stowe Elementary, which was where I was in North Carolina, was Global Experience Days. And Global Experience Days were a day where the whole school would take part. So we might do it in rotations, we might swap classrooms, but it was a day where a, the whole school focuses on one sustainable development goal. So for example, we had a day looking at quality education um, and we looked at education around the world, how people access education, what education looks like in different countries. Um, we had a day where we looked at zero hunger and, and that was a really important one because um, as a whole school, we looked at our own communities and we looked at global issues as well. So we looked at how people are accessing food, um, food banks within our own communities, um, uh, crops that were grown natively to North Carolina. Um, but the Global Experience Days are a, way, a great way for the whole school to collaborate. So you're not just collaborating with a, a classroom in another country, you're providing opportunity for students to collaborate within your own school on global issues, which is a great opportunity to look at how global issues are affecting your own community. Um, another great thing to do on those Global Experience Days is to invite community organisations in. Nine times out of 10, if you go knocking on a door and you ask maybe a police officer or um, a, a bird sanctuary or an animal protection charity to come in um, or, or somebody from a food bank, they can come in and share the experiences of people in your own community. It also gives you an opportunity to cover multiple sustainable development goals throughout the year. So at STOW, we had four throughout the year, four dedicated days, kind of one per quarter throughout the year. And it just gives a whole school focus on the sustainable development goals. Um, another really good idea with the global experience days is to link them into a, an outcome for the students. So students are highly, highly motivated if they know that there's an end outcome for what they are doing. So things like connecting with the Malawian classroom to find a solution or connecting with Mix and Falueki to create a solar oven. If they know that there is an end point, it's highly motivating for them. So, and one of the things that we did was connected one of our global experience days to a science fair um, or a STEM night. And so on that day, when we had the global experience day, I think it was clean and renewable energy. Every, every class within the school was looking at clean, clean and renewable energy. It gave children time and space to come up with their own projects related to the sustainable development goal and then they showed them at STEM night um, or, or at the science fair to their own parents. So it created awareness of global issues um, It helped them to engage with global issues and global learning but then it also gave them an outcome to be able to share their knowledge with their community at a science fair or a STEM night. Um, this is just a wee example of um, how I get going with a project. This is my most, this is my latest project when we were looking at the local river here, the River Clyde, um, and we were looking, trying to link that to the Pacific Garbage Patch and how actually our actions here impact ocean plastics. Um, so this is just how I plan. I look at each curricular area and I just jot down basic um, 
things that I think would fit in nicely with the topic. And then I go back with the global goals and look and see how I can tie the global goals into each one of those. So for example, um, looking at the history and significance of uh, one of our local ships, SDG and SG9, and then something I'm going to come up with in a wee second is collaborating with our local counselor, counselor to create um, an awareness campaign. But as you can see here, as an example, this is actually a condensed version because I couldn't fit it all into the slide. Um, but if you actually just sit down and don't even think about the, the, the experiences and outcomes yet, just jot down and say, okay, what are the experiences that we could have and how can we link them in then to the curriculum um, to meet our learning object objectives for this term? But it's just a brainstorm and then go back with the sustainable development goals. And then probably the most important one for me is real world connections. I'll always make a real world connections box and think, OK, but how can I connect them to the community or how can I connect them to the world or what virtual connections um, could we create with this topic? Um, which takes me to community based projects. So when I'm looking at real world connections, I'm thinking, OK, how can I give these students their place in the community, which is so important with global citizenship, is the whole objective for global citizenship really is to create well-rounded citizens. In order to do that, we have to help them or guide them to understand their place in the world. So with community-based projects, um, it's another way to collaborate. It's another way to exchange. Um, it helps them to partner with the community and with community organizations and the government, it gets them to know their community and who's in the community and what their roles are. Um, it gives students ownership over local campaigns. So they're very much a part of the process. So if we're doing a, a local campaign, it gives them, them ownership of what they're, they're doing. Um, I like to try and secure some funding in the process and knock on a few doors and see who wants to get involved uh, to kind of bring the students' ideas to life. Uh, usually I'll try and do some kind of community launch um, with the project just to kind of give the students the satisfaction of having that end product, whether it's parents coming in for a celebration or a poster launch or an online launch, it just gives um, meaning behind the learning. And students get to see their work come to life and inevitably they become very invested in the community because they're more aware of what's going on, what are the issues in their community and what's the global impact of the issues within their community. So it's another, like I said, there's different ways that you can do a virtual exchange. There's different ways that you can collaborate. You can collaborate with a class, you can collaborate with a person, you can collaborate with uh, community organizations. So here is one example um, that we did in Raleigh. We started a, a global podcast and the global podcast was centered around the sustainable development goals. And the aim of the podcast was we wanted to develop an awareness of global learning. We wanted to put a podcast out to the community to um, raise awareness of global issues, but also we wanted to develop confidence and we wanted to develop skill sets and we wanted to develop communication. So we were contacted by the Wakehead Partnership who um, put us in touch with the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, the teachers, it was myself and Ms. Bradley, um, we went off to the Chamber of Commerce who had just started their own podcast. And we as teachers received training on how to do a podcast, how to record it, how to edit it. And then luckily enough through the Wakehead Partnership, we were able to partner with a local radio station, which was very, very cool. So we were able to take all of our um, podcast hosts, which you can see them there at the radio station. We were able to take them into the radio station. And that's a, that's a kind of good example of seeing, you know, at the beginning of, the, of my presentation, I said, global learning provides opportunity for lifelong learning. And this is an example of opening up a whole new skill set and a whole new um, element of lifelong learning and showing students what is possible um, as they go on by, by exploring global issues at a local level. Um, students got to see their work come to life in the community. We would meet up once a week and um, record our podcast and then we'd meet again as we launched the podcast uh, to play the podcast to the hosts and they would get very, very excited. Um, and like I said, it opens up to new career choices as well. And it equips students with lifelong skills, you know, going to the radio station and having the opportunity to record their own little snippet in a professional studio is something that will stick with them. And so will 
all of the exploration that they did um, through each episode. So each episode would focus on a sustainable development goal and a global issue, and they would explore how that affects them locally and how that affects them globally. Um, and, and they would release that each week. So they became really, really passionate about um, global issues and, and how they were affecting the world. So this is the most recent one that I did. If I go back to the topic web, web example, this is us coming to the end of the topic web. Um, and I'm not actually quite entirely finished this project yet. Um, but this came from a project where we were looking at our local, our local river source. We were looking at history. We we're looking at industry, innovation, how the use of the river has changed over time, um, what the river means to the local people. And we were looking at some of the issues around the river, river in terms of pollution. And then we linked that to the Pacific garbage patch and we learned about ocean gyres and how um, actually dropping a piece of litter locally can turn into a bigger problem. So for this, again, which I like to do is I knocked on the door of our local councillor virtually um, and asked him if he would like to be involved. So through our local councillor, we were able to secure funding um, to create an awareness campaign in the community, which is currently underway just now. Um, students research local issues. So, so unfortunately now we're in virtual learning. So virtually they were um, researching local issues and then um, we developed an awareness of the Pacific garbage patch, how litter gets into the ocean, um, how this is harmful for the environment, what the projection of that looks like if we don't get the problem under control. And the students then created their own, using online learning, so this was all virtually, students are then leading their own campaign using the research that they've done on the sustainable development goals at Life Below Water and the impact of that on a local level. And so we teamed up with our counsellor and he secured funding for us and we've been doing a poster campaign which we've been perfecting over the past couple of weeks. And with our local counsellor, <coughs> we're going to launch banners in our community. Um, and the banners will be all over our community. And in April, hopefully, if things are starting to get back to normal, the students will go out into the community to launch the banners and create awareness in our local community of the global issues that are seriously affecting our local community. So that's just another example of um, collaboration with our local councillor. Um, just a couple of things that I, I kind of want to say around collaborations. Like I said, there's multiple ways that you can collaborate. You can collaborate with classrooms. You can collaborate electronically. You can collaborate with local speakers in um, local countries, and you can co collaborate with organizations within your local community and within your local schools. Um, but one thing I think is really important to say is um, seeing global issues at a local level is extremely important especially when it comes to virtual exchanges or especially when it comes to local collaboration. Because I think when we see global issues or we see the sustainable development goals through the solely through the lens of another country, we almost take away our own responsibility from that. So if we create a, a connection that also links to our own communities, um, it provides awareness and it provides opportunity and it provides ownership for the students. Um, also collaborating with local speakers um, I think it creates authentic experiences and you get to hear the voices of those people from those countries rather than just um, looking at videos that may not necessarily represent them or to read things that may not necessarily represent them. When we speak with global speakers um, in the countries themselves, we actually hear an authentic reflection of that country straight from people in, in those countries. And we give them the opportunity to tell their own, own story, which I think is really, really important. And the last thing is she, seeing collaboration as a sharing experience. So when you're doing a collaboration with a school in another country or a, a, a speaker in another country, it's not just you getting information from them. It's a, it's a sharing experience. You also have something that you can share with them as well, which I think is really, really important. So it's a kind of two-way sharing experience. So one of the main questions that I always get is, where do you find these connections? How am I supposed to find um, somebody that links in with what I'm doing? So there are several ways that you can look for people and there are several ways that I've found people. Um, United We Teach Community is a great online community um, which you 
will have obviously heard of because here we are at the United We Teach Summit. Um, so you can go on there and connect with other teachers on there. A great place is Twitter. Some hashtags to search on Twitter are Teach SDGs, Global Goals, United We Teach, and that can connect you with other teachers who are doing the same thing. I've connected with teachers in Kenya, India, um, and discuss with them what they're doing in their own classrooms. Um, teaching Facebook groups is a great way to find people as well. If you look up respective countries, so if you want to uh, do something in Australia, search for teaching Australia groups and look for other teachers in there that would be interested in collaborating. Um, a great one is networking. So even if you just meet an interesting person like Mixon Balawaki, I didn't know him before I met him one day. And I took his contact details because I knew, okay, I'm going to want to collaborate with you one day. And I think that the students should hear your story. So if you're at conferences or symposiums, seminars, uh, seminars, network with people and get their contact details. Um, another thing is keeping strong ties with previous schools. I know that if you're a participate learning teacher, um, the chances are that you've come from a school in another country. So keep strong ties with your school and nine times out of 10, they will want to collaborate or link in with you in some way. And the other thing is knock on doors and pick up the phone. Probably at the moment, you, you shouldn't be knocking on doors, um, but you can certainly pick up the phone or send an email. Um, and that's really the first step. If you connect with someone and they say, you know what, I don't think I can help you with that. Nine times out of 10, they'll say, but I know somebody who can. So be brave and be forward and just email people at, or, or phone people to try and get the the connections that you need but a main one really is Facebook teaching groups and Twitter hashtags are a great way to connect it with teachers in other countries and that is it so thank you very much everyone I know it's early in North Carolina so thank you everyone for coming to hear um, all about that and hopefully uh, that's been helpful to you if you want to connect feel free to send me an email um, or connect with me on Twitter and I'll be happy to go back over anything or if anyone wants to collaborate or has any ideas feel free um, to get in touch and we can chat. Thank you very much Katie and if everyone was in a room they'd all be giving you a standing ovation for that <laughs> for that session so I'm sure if everyone's on their gallery and you want to do a clapping uh, emoji or you want to stand up and clap in your room you'll by all means you can do that so thank you uh, thank you very much. Um, Katie, we've got a few questions um, that have come on the chat. Um, so thank you, people, everyone, for, for putting their, their questions in. If, if you do have a question while we're, we're going through the next part, um, please put it in the chat. I will try to get to it. Or if you put your hand up, use the hand up icon, I will try. I will attempt to see if I can spot you. And if any of Sarah, if you see anyone, give me a shout as well if anyone puts their hands up. So uh, let's go through the questions that came up first. Um, Thomas Williams asked, um, how did you find your project being enhanced or limited by uh, the national curriculum and the local school curriculum, as well as the required state testing requirements? Um, believe it or not, it's so easy to slot in. If you have an objective in mind and you start with the objective, now you do that brainstorming and see how you can tie it in. Um, there are so many ways that you can tie it in. If, you, if you're doing uh, life below water, then you could do your articles for comprehension all tie into that theme. Or if you're doing a research project, they're accessing articles that meet in with that theme. Um, looking at within my own classroom, when I was over in North Carolina, the growth that I would see throughout the year was huge because this really, really, really engages students, especially if you have an end outcome. These students are all in on what they're doing. I think um, the latest one, I did actually have a slide on it, but I don't know where the slide went. Um, the latest one in my final year in North Carolina, there was something crazy like 60% growth or 70% growth within the classroom. So you just have to look for opportunities to connect it with the local curriculum and um, as much as you can articles or numeracy just tie everything in but I, I personally found it it kind of synced very very well with the local curriculum both in America when I was in Malawi and also now that I'm back in Scotland I find it sinks in really really well because really no matter what curriculum you're in at the moment the focus is on project project-based learning and inquiry-based learning which this provides ample opportunity for that hopefully that helped. Thank you. Um, 
question from Carmen Castillo. Um, she asked, how much time do you spend on it? So I'm, I'm assuming in, in general, how much time do you, do you spend on each project? Um, that's also something that I get asked um, quite a lot because people assume, oh my goodness, you must be putting so much extra into just, you know, what you're doing within the classroom. But actually it's not because if you think about it, if you're doing, um, a, if you're looking at non-fiction texts and your whole thing is research-based questions, well, the only thing you're doing really differently is that you're looking for a global text or a text that relates to the issues that you're doing. So really, you can use resources to make it less um, work intensive because all you're doing really is switching up the theme of the articles that you're accessing. Um, in terms of some of the extra layers, it, it does take some time to plan. Like for example, when we're doing the trips or when I'm coordinating with a local counselor, it does take time out of your um, day. But like for example, the local project that we're doing with the council at the moment, I think I've spoken to him for, on the phone for half an hour or two weeks ago. Like for 15 minutes this week so it doesn't add on a whole lot um, of extra work and quite often you can slot that work into planning time and um, plts and things like that and um, so it doesn't take a whole lot of extra work and it's so student-led as well that's the other thing there's so much student ownership in it that actually it's the students who are doing most of the work and carrying the project forward um, with the objectives that we set Great. And uh, there's two other questions um, from Anna uh, and from Kendwin, who um, both about um, one was how long did the project last and what was your schedule for the project? And it's sort of linked to that last question. So um, in, do you have like a, do you set like a time frame up for each project in terms of how long it's going to take, how long it's going to, and the impact, like you said, on your, on the other core teaching responsibilities you have? Um, first of all, I know Ked, so I'll just say hi to Ked. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, no, there's there's not really any time frame or or any schedule to it. Some projects, for example, the water based project, I would do that kind of over a quarter. So so you're talking like an eight nine week project that kind of accumulates and has different elements into it. Um, things like the subsistence farming project that was just a kind of short two week unit, three week unit. Um, and then was carried forward when we obviously harvested the vegetables. Um, some of them, when we're speaking to a speaker like Mixon Falawiki, again, that was just a one week kind of unit on renewable energy. Um, so some of them eight to 12 weeks, other times it's just a short one week unit or, or two week unit. Great. A um, couple more questions just to finish off here, Katie. Um, yep. Kathy asked, uh, what are the banners made of? Are they outdoor or indoor banners? Um, um, so they are outdoor banners so we secured funding and they were sent to a professional um, printer so quite often actually your local councillor or your local MP is a good person to get in touch with um, because they also want to be able to um, talk about kind of what they've done in the community so they're a, a great person to partner with um, and quite often they have access to funding that I wouldn't necessarily have access to funding with so he sent them off to um, professional printers and there'll be outdoor banners kind of around the school and in the community so that when children walk past with families or with friends, they can say, oh, did you know that, um, you know, littering is a harmful process because, um, you know, it provides opportunity for them to talk about it in the community. Great. Uh, and one last question. I think it was more of a request. Uh, could you share the document to have an idea of how it looks, the word problem document? So. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm yep, sure that what we can that. do is put that in the United We Teach discussion forum yep. and we'll be able to upload it onto there. So I think yep, and that you, good. you might get more requests on that as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, thank you very much. And I appreciate that. Obviously, there was a lot to take in the presentation as well. So much content. And, and if you do have further questions, again, um, you'll be able to to ask Katie them or, or put them in the discussion in, in the forum, which I'm going to show in a second. And um, you can, Katie will be able to interact with you on there. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you again, Katie. It's obviously so much detail and so much content that you've provided for us today in, in such a short period of time. And, and we really appreciate uh, all the time and effort you have done to put this into me and having those extra phone calls with me in the week. Um, yeah, taking your time. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, um, and 
just uh, also thank you to everyone who's been attending today. There's just a few um, extra bits I'm going to go through now with you before we finish. Um, some people have asked about recordings of sessions uh, and the presentations, and they will all be um, uploaded in the next week and be put on in the United We Teach community of practice for people to view in their own time as well, if you want to, to go back to them. Now, I'm just going to share my screen uh, and attempt to be uh, as good at this as Katie never will be, but I can always aspire to Katie, I'll always try. <laughs> um, so you should be able to see, um, here is um, the United We Teach community um, and on there, so the, if you're looking um, for the discussion from today, um, you can see it there in the, in the virtual summit uh, and on there will be all the discussions that we've had today and all the different discussions that will be happening through the, all the sessions today. So please go back to that um, if you want to find out more uh, and I'm sure Katie will be able to um, put more information on there. Um, we also ask you to complete a summit reflection. Now that is also um, in the resources section as well. Um, and on there, um, let me go to the right one. Okay, you'll be able to uh, complete to complete the reflection and to receive your digital uh, attendance badge. Please, can you go through this? It's very short uh, and it's always um, great as well to find out what you thought of today. Um, so there's a, a, a summit feedback to complete. Um, and then any takeaways you have, any reflection uh, from today's attendance, from any of the sessions that you'd like to give us. And obviously we would like to do this again in the future and help build on these connections. So, so please um, feel free to, to give us any reflection you have on the day. Um, and we would also like you um, to be um, following and talking about this day on Twitter. Um, and you can see the hashtag United We Teach. Uh, and on there, there will be all, if you just use the hashtag United you know, We Teach, you'll see all the different, and you'll see Katie there. Um, so if you want to connect with her on social media, uh, but any of the other people that have been in attendance today and want to have a chat and talk about the event, um, please use that hashtag uh, to, to find out more. Um, I think that's it. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay. Um, well, all it left to say is, is thank you very much. Thank you for your attendance. Um, if you want to find out more about Participate Learning and obviously the experience Katie's had and all the different projects um, that we're doing at the moment, please go to participatelearning.com as well at your pleasure and, and also enjoy the rest of the day. So that's left to say is thank you very much for your attendance and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much, Katie, as well. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thank you.